Uh, so anyway, all right, without any other questions, uh, rambling. I know this has been high schoolish and maybe slightly boring, which again, I, I'm okay with that because I'd rather have you bored than confused. But today we're getting into actual, uh, well, college level material that might be more interesting, which is uh, what we call real, real gas uh, behavior. And what I mean by that is if I look at a P versus B, and I think I should go ahead and switch to a new pen. Okay, if I draw a curve, what's that called? An aside. An aside? What? No, oh, it's, I a, meant it, it's I an meant. isotherm. It's an isotherm, right? DVT. And we'll always assume n is constant. Um, when n is not constant, it's not that there's a hole in the magic piston. Uh, that will be when we're doing reactions. So you can always assume that. Uh, N is constant. So that means that this line has to be drawn at a certain T and that's why it's an isotherm. Okay, so I drew a very 1 over X type curve because P is proportional to 1 over V and that's perfect gas behavior. Most gases, especially nitrogen gas, which is a very well behaved gas, follow PV equals NRT incredibly well at terrestrial temperatures and pressures. Uh, one atmosphere, one bar, uh, 273, 298 degrees K, all right? So PV equals NRT works incredibly well, and you would almost not be able to tell a uh, experimental data over PV uh, versus PV equals NRT, you know, curve. Okay, but when you are either very cold at moderate pressures or very, very hot, this doesn't work anymore. And what you see, and, and this is not, I'm not just drawing wiggles for wiggles sake, I'm actually being really quite accurate about this. You start to see something like this. And again, uh, I'm not just trying to not follow the curve for the sake of not following the curve, that's actually kind of accurate what I just drew. So this does not look like one over x to me. It's not p is proportional to one over v. There's weighty curviness to it, so it's not, it's not perfect anymore. Okay, now let me give you one very simple, nuanced reason why that might be. I said that when temperature, uh, these are isotherms, and that if the temperature was very cold would be one of the reasons that this would happen. Why would that be? And I said very cold. I don't mean cold like tomorrow. I mean laboratory cold, like 50K. What would a gas do at 50K, which is like, you would die in a millisecond if you were 50K. It would solidify or liquefy. Right. liquefy if, if I would liquefy first, okay? So unless you're CO2, actually it would solidify first. Uh, it's about to liquefy. So why would a gas law work for something that's about to turn into a liquid? Of course it won't. It's not being facetious there. Okay, so anyway, that's one of the reasons that that would happen. And before I get into the more nuanced reasons why, uh, let, let me actually just write some equations down and then explain the logic behind the equations. I really debated for a while whether I should do it in reverse, uh, but I'm going to stick to the way I normally do this. I want to point out that I need new equations because PV equals NRT is overly simple. I see curviness, waviness to this that, that I, I can never describe that with something like PV equals NRT. That's utterly impossible. So I'm going to need something, I need equations with more stuff in it like a Taylor series. A Taylor series would work, and to do so, I'm going to, I'm going to start with my PV, but I'm going to write something else instead of NRT. And um, Actually, I'm going to start with NRT, I just lied. All right, but now I'm going to insert something like a Taylor series, because I know I can fit anything with a Taylor series. And uh, of course, I have to think about a Taylor series of what? I mean, you're used to 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x3 over 6 plus, anyway, you're used to that. This is basically the same thing, uh, and what I'm going to do is actually write it out. My x will be 1 over v. Not v, but 1 over v. And if you're thinking like, oh, what, what's the meaning behind that? Uh, I, I don't know. I think it, it just works well. But that's why. So it uh, makes the units work. Okay, so there you go. And this thing has a name. Uh, this is called the virial. And virial is like... I think that means force in Latin, something like that. So anyway, there's a reason for that name. Okay, so there you go. Um, 
Now, there's uh, another little nuance to this, which is that if you look this stuff up, you'll find that these constants, which again are like Taylor series, just weights of the higher order terms that just make it fit the data, uh, these, these guys are actually temperature dependent. And that makes this very accurate. OK, so that's great. Um, now, I'm actually not going to spend too much. I actually talk a little bit in the book about the variable equation, but I'm actually not going to in class uh, because it just kind of takes up a lot of time. I use the variable equation mostly as the fodder for questions. It just gives me something to ask you homework and test questions for. It's not, not just for homework's sake, but um, the problem with this guy is I already know that there's really nothing you could draw up here, squiggles. I could, I could tie and I often do a pin to my cat's paw and I go, kitty, go, right? And so she could draw all kinds of crazy stuff. And if I write out enough orders of the Taylor series, I will fit that whatever. So I don't, I mean, I already know that. So what's the point? Okay, in your homework, you'll find out there is a little bit more to it, but I don't really just do much with it except really use it to do homework questions like this one. Let's do a homework question. All right. Give you an idea what's on the homework, what's on the test, right? Homework's on the test. Okay, now I mentioned last time that I strongly emphasize knowing your units because if you don't get that right, you're talking gibberish. And you know, I, I'm sure you've heard this before, the most famous example that everybody who teaches STEM uh, brings up, the, Mar the Martian Observer, right? You know that one? Right, they were using yards at Boeing or, or McDonnell Douglas and NASA used meters and kabamo, $100 million slams into the ground. I mean, that was kind of worth it, right? Cool, but, but they, they were real pissed. But. Okay, so there's that aspect of it, uh, but then the other aspect that you might not, you know, if you don't care about things slamming into Mars, you know, cool, but uh, as I mentioned to you, if you're having problems with homework questions or God forbid you're having a problem with a test question, start looking at the units, especially if you get confused like what I'm even trying to ask. You know, look at the missing part of the equation and figure out what those units are. Then, you know, if it's in units of pressure, I'm asking about pressure. Anyway, you'll, you'll see what I mean, you know. Sometimes you have to take a test or two to figure this stuff out, like how, how, to, how to do this. But, okay, the two important thing about units is that they multiply into new units. Uh, and that, and now, now remember, multiply includes division. Multi division is just the multiplication of one over something, right? Just like subtraction is the addition of something negative. Okay, so you multiply units into new units, and that means a, while a kilogram is a kilogram and a meter is a meter and a second is a second, a kilogram meter squared per second squared is now a joule, right? And that's fundamentally different. Okay, so now that's kind of brainless, but the neater one, and I alluded to this last time, they add, and that means subtract as well, into the same. So when you see a sum, or if you see two terms across an equal sign, those have to have the same units. Now, and by the way, I always put this on the exam. There's a question like this on the exam, so I'm working a exam-like question. Okay, so knowing this, what are the units of B? And don't worry about the fact that it's temperature dependent. That, that doesn't matter. What are the units of B? Okay. Now, knowing these rules, let me do it the hard way. Because if, uh, so it's a rhetorical, what, okay, what do you think they are? Let's just, it's a, it's a uh, cubic length. So it's uh, like meters cubed volume. No, but, but I'm glad you asked. So um, I, I, I should be more interactive. And that's one of my faults. So, uh, then, if I, you're close. You're, you're, you get one, a two point question, you got one point. Not bad. Okay. Uh, but now let me walk you through this the hard way. And there's actually a trick. There's actually this real quick trick that would allow you to get this, get this question without any effort. Okay, but let's do it the hard way. Um, they multiply into, okay, well, um, one of the lowest level ones is that whatever's on the left and whatever's on the right have to have the same units. Now, um, PV, um, tell you what, let me, um, uh, let, let me recast this equation in a slightly different way, in a way that I often write this on exams and homeworks. 
What I like to do sometimes is divide by, multiply by n and divide by n. And what that means is that I'm going to end up writing this out in terms of what's v, uh, Vm, which is the volume per mole. And I do that often because you often see it that way, and it's a little bit easier for me to uh, write. So if you often see it that way, it might make this a little bit easier as well. So again, this is just N absorbed into the virial equation. You often see it this way. I, I like it this way. I didn't do it so much in the book. Okay, but I'm still looking for <coughs> B. Uh, B didn't change. B didn't change. I didn't mess with B. Okay, but again, things multiply to new units. They add, subtract to the same units. Now, PVM, whatever's on here has to have the same units as PVM. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I did last time that pressure times volume is joules. And so I divided by moles, so this is joules per mole. Okay, now I'm looking over here. So I guess um, I want to, I, I, let's, let's panic. Why don't we panic, right? Because you're going to panic during the exams and you have to get out of it. The thing that makes me panic when I see this is I've got to figure out the units of B. And I see a lot of things happening. It's divided by Vm, so that's already got me kind of PO'd. All right, but then it's in a sum, and the sum is multiplied. Between the, all that, oh, God, I'm already lost. All right. Okay. Again, we're doing this the hard way, but put it down, and let's, let's do this bit by bit. Okay. Note that uh, all the sums in the term, um, all the terms in the sum have to have units of joules per mole. And when I multiply it out, I've got RT, B over Vm. I've got a bunch of other terms. See, I've got RT plus uh, RTB over Vm plus RT, but that doesn't matter. Every term in the sum has to have the same units as that on the left, which is joules per mole. Okay, now again, remember, I'm working this a hard way. There's actually a shortcut. Anyway. Okay, now, uh, real quick, RT also has units of joules per mole. And again, I, I am assuming that you can figure that out, right? Uh, R is joules per K mole times K is joules per mole. Okay, you should be able, that's middle school, you should be able to do that. And that means that B over Vm has no units at all, which I represent by the number one. Therefore, B has units of Vm. You, you were close. Meters cubed per mole, that's, that's, that's your point off meters cubed. If you, put, uh, if you put liters per mole, that's fine. Uh, if you put for, fortnights times the speed of light cubed, I'm going to take a point off because you just pissed me off. Anyway, um, <laughs> make sure that the units make sense. So that's another reason why I don't, I don't get full credit when you're using if you use 8.314 for uh, R and you use um, uh, atmospheres for pressure, then you're, you're talking units, I don't know what they are. So that's why I take a point off question. Right, so the only difference between what you have and what I have is you divide it through. Oh, I divided by N, right, sorry. Yeah, you divide, so oh, you were right, sorry. They're really the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's dimensionless because your one is dimensionless. Yeah, yeah, right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I changed, I actually changed the definition of B, didn't I? Yeah, sorry about that. You got it right. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, it depends on how I write the equation. I just, I just lied and screwed that guy over. That's <laughs> the point. I owe you a point. I, I think I already know who you are. So anyway, so I screwed that up earlier. Um, I, I got a little lost because I usually write the equation this way. So I got a little confused there. Okay, but now, but now I heard something that brings up an important point, which is there was actually a way easier way to do this, that you can do it instantly. Remember that members, terms in a sum have the same units. So you could have just ignored this and looked at this. You could have just looked at that. Okay, what are the units of one? No, no units. So what's B, B over Vm? Unitless, no units. So B has to have units of Vm. There you go. Okay, and play this game further. C is meters to the six over mole squared. Or meters squared per mole squared. I, that fine, you know. Um, just remember, like, if you're gonna, if you're playing games with units, just make sure you use the right R. I'll, I'll, I'll count it right, as long as it is right. Uh, even if you're using furloughs for time, uh, <laughs> you're gonna rattle my cage, but I mean, if it's right, it's right. Um, so anyway, that's really all I've got to say about the virial. Uh, and 
Again, I will put a question like this on a test. It is important that you get your units straight. You're going to miss a lot of points if you don't get it right. And, and what I mean by that, by the way, is when you're not using the right gas constant. You're using atmospheres or bars and eight point. What, 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 really, really, don't do that. Don't do that. Right? Don't do that. All right, so I'm, I'm partially, I didn't mention this, I'm partially deaf. Uh, I had a childhood accident, so when you're talking in class, um, I am not less sensitive, I'm more sensitive to sound. Uh, because I, I completely shut down if, if I can't hear things. So I will snap at you badly, by the way. I, I haven't done that yet, but the, now you've seen it. Um, and if you're really bad, I'll tell you what I did. It's like, it's like you remember something about Mary, where you like cringe horribly at the beginning? I mean, it was something I did to my, I jabbed a spike through my ear. What, oh, I know, I shouldn't have told you that, I'm being cruel. I jabbed a spike through my ear, I was three years old, I didn't know what I was doing. So anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm almost totally deaf in my right ear. So anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, okay, so that's the virial equation. Uh, I, I, I don't do much with it because I just don't get a lot out of it, but what I do get a lot out of is the van der Waals. Van der Waals. Okay, Van der Waals equation again gives us those little wiggles in those P versus V isotherms. It's a real gas equation, uh, but it has a lot more immediate meaning, so I like it a lot better. I designed most of my questions around it, so that's that's maybe what you might want to know more about. Um, in the book, I tend to give it this way. You usually see uh, P, you can always see PV equals NRT in this stuff, <coughs> uh, but th then, then these real gas equations give it a little bit of a twist. So, so this is almost P equals NRT over V, except there's this um, thing subtracting out of B. Uh, and then we've got this guy, uh, this guy as well, and A and B are constants. Uh, and they're unique constants for every gas. Um, they are, uh, you, you might, you probably should write this down. They're not temperature dependent. I'm not gonna write it down. I, they are not temperature dependent. I mean, they, they could be made temperature dependent, but at that point, um, you know, if you, it's just kind of ridiculous. They, they just didn't make it temperature dependent. Um, it certainly would be a lot more accurate. It is not nearly as accurate as the very old, not, not even close, and I give examples in the book about that. Don't. It, there you go, that's all I really have to say about that. Uh, again, this is how I put it in the book, but how I put it on homework and, and test questions. Uh, again, I absorb, that's why I got a little flummox before, I, I usually absorb the N, the moles into the VM, to, into volume to give VM. Typically do that, it's just easier for me to write out, so uh, just be a little careful when you're doing questions uh, that, um, if, if you're working this guy, make sure you take the moles and, and uh, take volume and divide by that, uh, or, or you're off. Okay, so there is a, tri you know, like, like the virial, there's kind of a trivial way to look at this, which is that this equation is bigger and there's more terms, there's more stuff, and that stuff is empirical, and so of course it does a better job. That's true. But this guy won a Nobel Prize, and they don't do that just for curve fitting because they had curve fitting back in 18 whatever. Okay, it turns out that A and B mean something. And also, remember that yesterday I talked about how one of the goals of the course are to make measurements, crude measurements, like pressure and temperature and volume in a cowhead balloon, and back out, back out things about molecules. Uh, and if you can do that, you're the world's greatest physical chemist because, I mean, a cowhead balloon is pretty damn crude, yet actually in 346, if may, I, I don't know who's going to do 346, it could be me, you can take PV, um, pressure, volume, temperature data, and back out the velocity, the velocity of the gases that's in that balloon. That's, that's pretty neat, right? So, um, okay, so I, and I lost what I'm talking about. Anyway, so... So the reason that the guy won a Nobel Prize is that you can back out properties of molecules from these A and B parameters. And to show that is a type of derivation, this is typically one you see on the exam. The exam ends with, a, sorry, the exam begins with some easy questions and ends with some hard questions. The hard questions are usually derivational. Let me give you an example. 
And this, this, the example here is to figure out what does A mean? So what I've done in the past, and I'm going to use the PM form, what I've done in the past is I've made up an equation of state that's very similar to the van der Waals or the Virial. If you've done some Virial uh, homework questions, then, then um, I'm more comfortable with that. If not, then I do a van der Waals-like um, question. And so uh, now what I want to do is manipulate this thing and try to figure out what A and B are. And I'm going to manipulate it by doing things like radically increasing the pressure or radically decreasing the pressure, uh, driving the gas into an area where I, where I know how it should be behaving, and then figuring out what A and B are telling me as a result. And it helps to do my example. Okay, so I already said um, I'm going to uh, make the conditions extreme. So make P small. Okay, and the way to make P small is to make what big? Volume. Make volume very big. Okay, now if you have your website open, as if you do, um, actually you're not so bad. Uh, a couple years ago, like half the students had their laptops open and they're just going, oh, look at that. You know, hey, we're so these on. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> but if you had your website open and you're looking at the Wikipedia data page on uh, van der Waals constant, you'll see that B tends to be, these are like really small numbers. Uh, B is in liters per mole, it's like 0 .001 or something like that. That is a really, really, really small number. Okay, so if pressure is small and B is very big, then, now I'm going to put a little squiggle here because this isn't, um, they're not equal anymore. So what I'm going to do is um, just forget B. Okay, so that, that was an incredibly easy derivation, right? Okay, I've forgotten uh, B. Uh, again, B is very, very, very small. Now what I've got here, you may notice that this is the real perfect, and it would help if I could spell, perfect gas pressure. And I'll call that P naught, uh, because I'm not sure what else to call it. There's, I kind of hate that because I know at the end of the class we're going to have a different type of P-naught, so anyway. Okay, now what I get from this, um, and I'm a little concerned about you folks over there, I don't know if you can see this, so I'm going to wipe this out and just keep moving left to right. That's why I don't like having just one board. Uh, okay, so now what I'm going to do is take the van der Waals pressure and subtract RT of VM, which is P-naught, and then what have I got left on the other side? A over VM squared. My, minus, wait, what have I done? Did I screw it up? No, 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 yeah, okay, okay. Ta-da! You don't care. Okay, here's what's happening. Uh, this is the van der Waals pressure minus what the perfect gas would normally have given me. Now, again, if we had our Wikipedia page open, all the A's are constant. Uh, the Wikipedia data page, you know, not everything forms a gas. If you try to gasify some chemical, a lot, most chemicals, they'll actually decompose before they become gases. So Wikipedia has basically all the gases that are known to exist, and all the A's are positive. Therefore, delta P is always what? Right, because there's no such thing as a negative VM. Even if there was, it's squared. Okay, so all this is positive, except I got a minus sign, so it's always negative. Now, I play this game quite a bit. Is it, is it plus, is it minus? You've already heard that, and you're going to keep hearing that. Expect it on the exam. Okay, so delta P is negative. It's always negative. The van der Waals pressure is always that. Sorry, <laughs> under low pressure conditions, I have to be careful. It's not always true. Um, this equation is actually complex enough that there's nuances, but under low pressure conditions, the van der Waals pressure is less than the perfect gas pressure. Okay, and A is responsible for that. So now I've got to think about why that is, and, and I happen to know the answer, so I'm just going to go ahead and get it. Um, it has to do with attractive forces. Because, and I'm going to give an extreme example. It's one of my favorite little facts that I know, that HCl is a gas. A lot of people, oh no, that's an acid. It is if you bubble it through water. 
But uh, in its natural state, uh, if I take protons and chloride ions and put them together, that damn thing just jumps out at me as a gas, not a liquid. In fact, that's why HCl versus other acids, HCl is not very concentrated. It's like 35% HCl. Sulfuric acid is 100%. That, that's pure sulfuric acid. Nitric acid is about 75%. HCl is less, 35%. It's because the way they make it, when you start making HCl, you bubble it through water. After you've got so much in, which isn't that much, it just bubbles out. So HCl is a gas. It's also very polar, and that means it can do stuff like this. Um, it can line up just the right way uh, to electrostatically interact. So they're attracting to each other. Now you can, um, there's other ways to do this, of course, you can, um, I, I don't know what, what's, a, a psychiatrist would have a field day with me, but I often use the analogy of a dog sniffing, sniffing another dog's butt, um, and I'll do that with many things. Um, but now you also can imagine that uh, if I flipped one of these over, that they would be repulsive. Uh, yes, that's true. And if you're thinking real deeply, well, for every positive interaction, there would be a negative one. And, and now you're really thinking. But it turns out that nature finds a way. That things always will orient themselves such that they're very attractive to each other. And that's going to be something that's pressure lowering. And that's, so, that's what you're seeing A do, is the, the fact that things are polar. But now let me, let me throw you a curveball. What about xenon? H, now, HCl is a very extreme example. It's, it's got a huge dipole. What about xenon? What's the, pole, what's the dipole moment of xenon? I owe you what? What, what is it? It's very small. Uh, zero. <laughs> Minus one. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, it's very, very small. It's zero. So, um, so, so, so what? So this doesn't work, right? So the A parameter of xenon is zero. The A parameter of xenon is actually quite large. Here's what's happening. Um, at any given moment here, I have to uh, maybe help them. Let me sure my notes are correct. Okay, think about, now I'm gonna, uh, as, as my phenomenological models are often very crude, uh, this is why I was giving the dog's butt uh, analogy just a minute ago. Two xenons can line up like this. Right now, I know that in quantum mechanics we show electron distributions, s orbitals, as like these little spheres or perfect spheres. But in a given moment in time, that electron is somewhere. And the, the nucleus, of course, is somewhere. That's where all the action's at anyway. So you get two xenon atoms. Let me, let me label in case you um, get lost in your notes. Uh, at any given moment, the electrons are somewhere. And as I mentioned, for reasons, that even I, I mean, geez, I have a PhD in this stuff, but I really don't understand this. Things have a way of lining up energetically, interactingly good. They always figure out how to do it that way. I mean, again, you know, the electrons could be pointed this way and that'd be bad, but they don't choose not to do that. They always figure this out. I never really quite understood that. And I'm not being facetious. So, um, so no, no, good, good. We like each other, sniff each other. Like my cats, my cats will, oh, I should have talked about my cats, it was disgusting. Um, so anyway, so, uh, so everything, this is what the A parameter does, and it drives pressure down. And I was, my other analogy for this, now I'm still talking about this, is um, it's kind of like how galaxies are held together by gravity. It actually, it, some of you may know, you physicists, actually dark matter, but anyway, uh, gravity holds these galaxies together and without their mass and dark matter, apparently, they just fling right apart. And so gases are kind of doing that too, with electrostatics being the, the same thing, you know, it's standing for gravity. So um, gravity doesn't really matter to molecules, but electrostatics does. Okay, so that's what the A parameter is. Again, the A parameter is responsible for light for dogs smelling each other's butts, uh, for <laughs> molecules having um, positive interactions. So let's do the B parameter, and I'll just try to do that uh, briefly over here. Now, another important thing is, now again, I, I preach, I teach to the test, I preach to the test, probably way too much to be blunt, but uh, I think that's the part you care about, and that's how I manipulate you into paying attention. Uh, let me start with the uh, Van der Waals equation in the VM form. And again, what I was saying was that uh, this is, 
I'm always putting a question on the test like this, every, every time. And the thing is, is that I have such flexibility with like how to create a, a real gas equation. I've never asked the same question twice. Be careful about that. I know most of you have my old exams, and you are the ones who are going to actually do the worst. I, I, and I even know who you are because I'm not going to get you or anything. It's just that when I'm, I, I grade the exams too, I'll see the, my um, answers to my old tests. So I know that that's what you did, but the, the problem is that it's always wrong because I always rewrite these. Right? I have my old exams. A lot of you do too, and so do I. So don't do that. Uh, and I'm not trying to, to be tricky here. I, I seriously rewrite these. So don't do that. So anyway, again, what I'm going to do is give you a, a Van der Waals like uh, question and say, hey, tell me what the B parameter is. So, okay, for the Van der Waals, the B parameter, let's, let's bring over the A term onto the left. And then we're going to um, multiply uh, times Vm minus B. Uh, uh, let, let me, uh, I'll write down the instruction set, like what am I doing? Sometimes I'll forget, so I, I don't want you to get con uh, confused. And I'm going to write this a little bit more compactly, because I'm uh, running out of space. So sometimes I don't really plan ahead too well. Okay, uh, now what I can do is uh, a little bit more algebra, and um, now I'm dividing by uh, the, the, this P term. Okay, and then I'm going to bring B over to the other side. Okay, so there you go. Okay, now the value of this is, is that I've gotten B by itself. I, I tried to do that with A, I, I couldn't quite do a perfect job. Uh, but B, I was able to get it off by itself. So that's, that's now I'm in a good position to do something like crazy extreme and, and have B, you know, B by itself and figure out exactly what it is. And in this case, what I'm going to do is, um, um, let's see, very, very high pressure. And if that happens, what happens to this term? I've got RT over P, and P is very big. Oh, is zero. Zero. Now, now, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. How do I make P very big? By small volume. Well, hold on now. I've got A over a small number. What's that? It's also a big number, right? <laughs> so, yeah, you can wipe this out. I'm just trying to be funny with this. Um, RT over a big number plus a big number. Sometimes you have to be careful that, you know, you might get plus infinity, minus infinity. L look out for that. We, we'll run into one or two of those. It's, it's not common, but you have to be a little careful. Anyway, so this gets wiped out at high pressure. Okay, so now I've got B. Now I've got the units of B. That's cool. It's, it's volume per mole. Um, but what is B? And if I have a gas under extraordinarily high pressure, okay, let me give you another hint. God, I'm always doing this. I do it too much. When I ask questions like this, you're allowed to think in absolute extremes. I have a gas that I pressurize by putting the sun on top of it. What happens to the gas? Some of you even talked about this earlier when I talked about freezing it. <coughs> Really? You're not sure? What do you think would happen to anything? Liquefy. Liquefy or even solidify. Right. Yes, yes, of course. It'll liquefy or solidify. So what's B? Remember, this is the volume now of the solid. Volume per mole is a solid. Makes B the volume per mole of, or better yet, the molecule. Remember, we're talking about molecules. It's actually the volume per mole of a molecule. Right, because take uh, take a take 18 grams of water. What's the volume? Oh, come on, 18 grams of water. What's the volume? 18. Think in mils. 18 mils. Okay, that's one mole. How many particles are in a mole? 18 divided by that is the volume of what kind of molecule? Right, it begins with a W and ends in otter. It's right, so you see, you can kind of figure out the volume of water. You can figure out, it's basically the volume of a molecule. Now, it's not quite right, because there's spaces in between. In next homework, you're going to do a question related to that. But anyway, what I've seen from here is that B is related to the volume of a molecule. 
And um, there you go. Uh, so last, but we're actually almost done here. Uh, and uh, I've got one or two more things to say about A and B. Now, again, uh, this is something that generally also makes it to the final. It's funny how some of the really important stuff comes up early on. Uh, B is the size of the molecule, which matters to its pressure volume behavior, its gas behavior. The volume of the gas itself matters, the gas molecules. Molecules aren't attractive. Even if they're two xenons, they actually attract each other. Uh, and that affects gas behavior, gives us those wiggles and those isotherms. And, and that's what does it. And so we're able to connect uh, isotherms to the properties of actual molecules. We can even estimate their size based on collecting PV data for gases. So that's, I, I don't know, I think that's kind of cool. Um, now, when it comes to um, the size of a molecule, I'm going to go back to my xenon example. And um, I want to try to bridge all this together. So what happens is when you get two things that are too close together, even though that they were sniffing each other's butt, this is some 346 stuff, quantum. So I'm going to tell you a little quantum mechanical principle here. What happens is, remember uh, the Alfau principle when you've got um, le atomic levels and then you fill them with electrons pointed up and then you go back and fill them with electrons pointed down? So what's happening is a violation of that, the Alfau principle. You're shoving an electron, like you're trying to put two up electrons in the same orbital when you're putting two xenons too close to each other. And you know you can't have two pointed up electrons in the same orbital. That is an attempt to do that, and it won't let you. And the way it doesn't let you is, let's look at the potential energy. Now, notice I didn't use V for potential energy because that's volume. And let's look at distance, and we're going to look at it like a nanometer scale. Uh, as atoms get close to each other, uh, really maybe, you know what, let me let me do an angstrom scale. Now let me do nanometers. Let me do nanometers. I'm sorry. I'm being wishy-washy. I just I had to do some conversions in my head. Uh, so these would be uh, 0.3, 0.5, 1.0. It's a little easier to do this in the angstroms. Anyway, all right, so what happens is when you put two xenons together, um, when they're far apart, they don't care. When they get closer together, they go down in energy because they're sniffing each other's butt. But Whammo. Whammo. When they get too close to each other, you get this problem of two electrons being in the same orbital, orbital and the energy just shoots up. And that prevents you from doing that. So anyway, uh, so here we see the attractive behavior. So this is like the um, A region. And then here's like the, the B region. This is what gives you things don't like to run into each other, um, but they, they kind of like getting so yay close to each other. Uh, let's see. Now, the other thing I wanted to tell you was, um, actually, no, I, got, I got a decent amount of time. I'm a little, I, I always tend to go over, I tend to get a little panicky. Um, that, uh, and this is an aside, maybe don't write this down. Don't write this down. Uh, when, when we wrote this down last time, so don't write it down now. I'm just kind of going off on a tangent. And I'll tell you when I'm doing that because it's not clear because of the way I am. Um, last time when we created this, that was not a derivation. That's not a legitimate derivation. That's pulling a bunch of empirical observations, Boyle's, Charles Lewis, and Avogadro's hypothesis. We pulled empirical observations and created this. That is not a, a, a thermodynamic proof. I do know how to do uh, PV equals MRT via a thermodynamic proof, but it requires graduate level mathematics. Uh, it's, it's not terribly difficult, but it's like you'll be ready for that in two years if you go to grad school. And I'll show you how to prove it. But you prove it by assuming, assuming no interaction, and that means that the A parameter is zero, and no volume, that there is no volume. Gases don't occupy any of the V volume, right? So when I say volume, I mean the size of the magic container, but inside of that volume is volume taken up by the molecules themselves, 
But if you ignore that, you get PV equals NRT in the thermodynamic proof. And it's not fully correct. So the B parameter takes care of that. A parameter is attraction. But B, B is kind of interesting because it's why things don't like to ram into each other. And, and I just talked about electrons overlapping each other, and that's bad. Um, but it also means, now think about this. When, when you Google Wikipedia this stuff, you'll see that the Van der Waals equation takes into account that, that molecules will collide with each other, uh, that they have volume. Notice that those, are the, those sound like different things. They're not different things. Things that have no volume cannot collide, right? So that's the connection there. So anyway, I'm just pointing that out because I often see descriptions of Van der Waals online of, of B takes into account the volume of the molecules or the fact that they collide. My point to you is that those are actually the same thing. So that's just, I thought that's kind of neat. Uh, the last bit I wanted to show, and then we'll end on time, 10 minute break, and then um, come back and uh, I'm gonna tell you that uh, it's all, I, I, I can do some questions if you have some for a few minutes, but I do have a formal lecture prepared. It's a Calc review. Now I did put a Calc review on the website and that if you, I mean, you know, I, you, you should know what a derivative is, but I seriously had a class that didn't, so that's why I made that video. If you've seriously forgotten all of your calc, that's why that's there. The next lecture is on multivariable calc, which you do need to know. So I'm going to cover multivariable calculus. And as I said before, if you don't stick around for the extra hour, I'm not going to go particularly nuts, especially if you're okay with your math. But if not, then stick around. Um, okay, with that said, I just want to say two last things about Van der Waals, uh, Van der Waals constant to solidify this whole, they have volume and that they're attractive to each other. Let's look at the B, remember I told you that the B constants are very small? I mean, yeah, they're horrifically small. But notice that as I go down the periodic table, as I go down the periodic table, um, there's an obvious trend here. The B parameters are getting bigger and bigger. Um, and I have a lot, we're going to talk more about helium next time. Helium is a very odd gas. Helium has behavior that's very different than all other gases, and it's due to a unique combination of its low B volume and low A, low, sorry, low B and low A. Um, it does some really neat things, and, and, uh, and I'll draw some. Um, See, that's one thing about PowerPoint. Uh, I, I have to draw data uh, because I just refuse to do it otherwise. Uh, now, if I look at melting temperature, and this is uh, in Kelvin, you know, if I'm talking about melting of gases like nitrogen, then obviously I'm talking very low temperatures. So obviously this is in Kelvin. Okay, then I plot the A parameter, and the A's are very small, so I'm not going to like create tick marks here. Uh, it turns out that, again, we see behavior that's very sensible. We see, as we go down the periodic table, we see that um, things become more interactive and their melting points increase, and um, we actually get a, a just almost perfect line with melting behavior in the A parameter. Now, think about why, why do things melt, right? Um, it, it's, it's entirely because their interactions are, are basically going away as they enter the liquid state. When you're in the solid state, things are interacting incredibly closely, but as they melt to a liquid state, those nearest, nearest bonds are now shot. I and mean, they're still interacting, but it's not nearly as much. So that's why I can correlate the A parameter with attractive interactions, because attractive interactions are what hold solid together, and therefore, if I heat things up enough that that's no longer true, I should get linear behavior with the apron. So, so that kind of makes sense. Uh, let's see, there's another thing. Um, I also wanted to point out that, I, I kind of screwed up one thing. I should have pointed out that, when I was talking about xenon-xenon interaction, uh, you've heard this before, uh, dispersive interaction, Right, you've heard that before. London forces, dispersive interaction, those are two words for the same thing. We often have two words for the same thing. I don't quite know why, but we do. And hopefully you remember that dispersive interactions, um, polarizabilities, maybe you've heard all these. 
It turns out that things have stronger dispersive interactions if they're bigger and fuzzier. And if I could shrink myself down and hold a helium atom, it would be like a golf ball. It would be very hard, rigid, and just not, not, like, a, not like something like a xenon, which would be more like a foosball, right? It'd be very squishy and big. And those electrons are more flexible as a result, and so they are able to uh, participate in dispersive interactions, and that xenon is up where, somewhere up here on the line. And uh, anyway, so it's just, uh, just trying to basically provide more proof that the A parameter is due to attractive interactions. Okay, so uh, this is a gone two minutes over, and we'll be starting to move later.